interactive session and slides are more not just as a discussion, right? What you call you know, market research uh, terminology. Is that okay? Or, well, otherwise, if I just go by the slides, honestly, I'll be done in less than 10 minutes. Which, uh, no? So, how many of you come from the development background? How many of you come from the testers or the QA background? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so most of you are from. Yeah. And I can show you. You have. Okay. And uh, how many of you are still in the waterfall model? And how many of you are in the. You are? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I can't be both camps, but yeah, the company's talking agile, we're not yet doing it. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And how many of you are really in waterfall, but you say that you are in agile? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a, like a two weeks waterfall model, and many of our customers follow that model. And, uh, no, that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting to say the least. But some of you are in true agile, uh, agile model, okay. So, would any one of you like to share one of your experiences in agile testing? What do you think works? What do you think does not work? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a developer, and I think uh, we sit together as a group of developers and our tester. And one of the things that I think is very helpful is just proximity to the tester. So, for example, even if I get a bug or something to work on, the tester is most likely familiar with, with it, so I can go talk to them right away. And the, just the quick turnaround of being able to communicate that with the tester. Or even if I'm doing something new and I'm like, this is kind of complicated, I'm just going to quickly explain it to the tester so that when he gets this tomorrow, he won't be very confused and he'll actually know what to start doing with it. And whatever industry you are in, is it a software product or IT shop or? Um, we do web applications, so software as a service. Software as a service, okay. So you must be doing releases quite often, like every week or every, every day, month. every month? Okay. And what are the typically the cycles, the sprint cycle? There are two weeks, one week? One week. One week, okay. And you are the, yes. you are the <laughs> tester working with? Yes. So what's your perspective on what she said? Um, I, I agree with what Sarah said. It's definitely a benefit to be able to um, be able to interact with the developers quickly and not have to wait for an email or, or a response to a ticketing system. Um, it gives a lot more flexibility. To get so suppose done. he's not sitting next to you, then what happens? <laughs> well, I work from home. I think I work from home as well. And he does too. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, Skype, go to meetings. Oh, okay, so it's not the literally sitting there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, not always, but sometimes. Sometimes it's a literal, like, hey, come across the room. And do you have proper requirements and user stories and some of those things, or it's quite so the agile is used now everywhere, so it's or it's quite agile in the process. Well, it will depend on what it is, but there's usually some degree of requirement, usually not like a full a full blown something, but there is at least an idea and it's usually written down. Um, so I guess you can call it a requirement, but it depends on what it is. And do you have a separate team or working on the requirements and user stories, etc.? I'm one other person. Yeah. Oh, you're another person, sorry. And how big is the team? The development team is about six people. Tester, one person. The requirements person, one. Yeah, the requirements person. Yeah. small company, 20 people. Any other experience? My team is very similar in structure to theirs, um, but we run at a third of the speed. <laughs> so we release every three months instead of one. Uh, our sprints are about four each. Just having good close proximity in a literal sense. Um, a lot of times, a developer will get done with uh, this feature, and I'll just let them know. So, as soon as it's uh, built, I can just go start testing it right away. Um, the advantage of being giving feedback on the ways we developed you know, while it's the fresh in So, you can just go back and correct it. So, who owns the quality? Like, who says, yes, this product is ready to release? At the end of three months, is it quality guys? Is it the project owner? Is it the dev manager? Um, it's it's actually uh, distributed through most of the company now. Uh, we have a rather convoluted sign-off uh, procedure that we have developed because uh, well because our customers are very resistant to take on change. So not only does uh, testing and dev 
sign off. That basically says it signs off saying that they will look at the test. Uh, testing signs off saying that they will test. Um, support has to sign off saying that they've received acceptance from all the stakeholder customers. So, like I said, a lot of the different areas of the company that aren't necessarily part of the actual software development process become involved in order for us to get something released. Does it sound too agile? What's that? That part doesn't sound very agile. Maybe it isn't, yeah. but we've had to evolve that because of the nature of our customers. I mean, we sell software as a service, much like they do, but we're selling to uh, oil companies, yeah. so BP, Chevron, and they are set up to accept change in an agile way. So that's why we do every three sprints, because it's only about once a quarter that they can sit down and actually take a look at the new features you know, in a user acceptance environment. So usually what happens is when we deploy to the user acceptance environment, that product at that point goes through the customer user acceptance and stuff. Meanwhile, the team is busy working on the next quarter. So they keep going, you know, on the new features for the next quarterly release, but what's in user acceptance testing might have a little bit of rework or there might be some feedback that needs to be adjusted, but basically at that point, it's stabilizing and getting ready for the next production update. Any other input otherwise, so put the first slide. So anyway, the first slide is really the sales pitch on uh, Optimus QA. So that's part of the team. As I speak earlier, the whole team will really put one slide. But now we are the largest independent uh, software QA company in British Columbia. We serve more than 40 customers uh, in BC. And uh, why I asked you that question about the global? So many times uh, in our business, some of our customers do development here, but part of the testing happens here, part of the testing happens from our center. In India, it brings its own uh, complexity around language, time zone, cultural issues. And at the same time, uh, really the, many of our customers even have daily releases, etc. So you know, there are certain uh, things we have learned along the way. Almost 100% of our work really happens with customers who are uh, working in the agile model. So there are a lot of good things so, over a period of time to learn in an experiment I think we have learned. And uh, obviously part of the reason why we are strong in test automation and performance testing is right? because of uh, the agile work. I think test automation is becoming more and more important. And we use tools like uh, QTP, Quality Center, Open Access on HP, and obviously Microsoft's test automation framework is improving significantly over in the last two years. And uh, the last point I added particularly we, more than Agile Vancouver and BenQ, we as an organization have launched two initiatives. One is we sponsor TEDx Gates, which is TED Talk for youth, which is basically uh, yeah, grade, grade 7 to grade 12. And actually the annual event is on October 20th this year, so if anyone of you is interested who has young kids who want to attend it, let us know. And then in Science World also, we have launched an initiative where, you know, what we are, Science World today in Vancouver is perceived as a daycare on a rainy day. We are trying to change that image and see how we can make you more in making science an interesting, uh, something of interest to them. So again, for that, you can visit futurescienceleaders.com. It's an interesting concept we are trying to develop. So just to set the expectations for this session, and that's why we did a little bit of rehearsal before, is whatever we are saying in the next few slides, that's what we feel. This is not necessarily right or wrong. This is all view of the world, which is obviously limited, as well as it has its own bias. Because we come from outsourcing world, many times I think of no, we, we can have a higher empathy towards customers, which obviously many times we don't have. Also, we try to make this session as interactive as possible. It's really not a monologue. And uh, our selfish uh, interest in this is that we want to learn from the audience because all of you are really doing the work, you know, what works and what does not work. Any questions?
Yeah, so this one uh, is really how the lean started. So one is we are using the word lean and agile a little bit interchangeably here. While if you go strictly by agile, it is a more well defined structure in terms of there should be pair programming, two people working together, etc. etc. Et they have a reasonably well defined methodology. What we are saying in lean is it's a looser or a loose structure where you use certain concepts of agile, but today, as you must have seen, there's a lean startup concept in software, lean manufacturing, everything people are trying to do around lean. I think the way I look at it is really it's more about uh, being really the faster, better, and cheaper. So wherever you can avoid the wastage, you avoid that, and wherever you can compress the time, you compress it. The issue with that definition is that obviously it puts uh, some different owners or some higher responsibility on tester because if you really have to compress the time, reduce the time, reduce the wastage, you also need to know where the wastage is happening. That means you need more visibility up front in the cycle. So in a traditional waterfall or even really to some extent even in traditional agile, a lot of work you will know when the development has already happened. So here what is happening is that you do the requirements, development and testing, this was the traditional cycle, but now testers need to be engaged much earlier in the cycle. And uh, fortunately for us as a service provider and uh, many times not so good for customers that many customers are struggling with that as an, with that as an issue. So any thoughts, any questions? Yes. Um, you are on the other side, you are a developer, so. <laughs> yes, um, but uh, in, in regards to involving the tester earlier in the process, one of the things that we do is, uh, you know, our tester is in all of our scrum, he's in all the dev meetings, he's on the dev mail, and basically treat him like a dev, other than the fact that he doesn't write code. He's there all the time, and he knows pretty much whatever we know, other than the code that we're, the actual code itself. But everything else about what we're doing, He's there for, and I think that's actually really helpful. <laughs> any other, any other feedback? You are also from testing background, yeah? Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Collaboration, interaction helps particularly when you I've done experience with offshore, but in the end, the but also my feeling is many times testers are not ready to be engaged earlier because of the way a traditional tester is, you know, they are very comfortable with the idea of okay once the software is ready, now it's a black box testing I have to do, give me the requirements, give me the software, I will play with it and tell you what are the 20 defects. Yeah, I, mean, I think by testing along the way and right away, it allows us to test those specific bugs that are being worked on and, and report issues with them. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to do a little bit of further testing down the road as well, the more general testing um, to capture things that we potentially missed or that fixes to the bugs caused. So I think there's a bit of, a bit of both. Jason, any thoughts? One thing I've been curious about is how the experience of people in the room, how early in a sprint has a tester actually executed some tests? Has the earliest been after one day, after two days? The day of. The day of. Something ready and test go you can start you need to start testing right away. In the case of bugs, you know, a bug comes in, you could fix you depending on the priority of the bug. It's really important it can be fixed the same day. Test it the same day and upload it the yeah. same day. Um, you know, I, the tester should definitely be involved in the small issues too, and those can have a very short turnaround time. And there's a degree as soon as this code change can be tested. Right. Yeah. So the demo, fix that night, first day of the next sprint, go fix the test. We we work on the basis of continuous it was continuous integration into the dev build, and that's um, automatically deployed along those checkers. So it's a bit of an inconvenience for testers that your environment goes down at times for the next deployment, but it does mean that 
Bob, I found a defect. Okay, ten minutes later, half an hour later, whatever. It's fixed, the next build, the next build comes out. We don't even know a lot of defects with this. I think the only difference we have is uh, the adapter to home environment. So we have the automatic builds every time somebody checks in code. But as a tester, I can elect when I want to update. So, and uh, there's two of us, and we can maintain our own independent test environments. So, there's been times when I've updated and I've noticed that there's something really wrong. But my other testing partner is in the middle of testing a key feature. That's why I've sometimes advised him don't take this next build, right? You know, just hold on until this gets resolved before you go for it, because it'll just disrupt what you're doing. So you are not running any test on the building? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm building it into my test environment. We have a development environment. Actually, each developer has their own environment in the shared database. Uh, in test, we have our own environments. Um, then from there, there's a staging environment. There's a user acceptance environment. And then we finally get to production. So no, we're just one step along in the pipeline. But it's, what I'm saying? They build in the building and then running tests right away. Like you didn't have to build them, like you described before. Right, I was talking about a more, you know, manual, you know, the testers that actually involve a testing scenario. Uh, we do have automated tests as well. And yes, they run, you know, that's perfect. <coughs> so that's, that's already taken into account. And some of the time, like I mentioned, we have like every three sprint before we go to production. So some of the time, there's a bit of bleed over. So for example, early in the sprint, if there's not anything immediately new that's available, we still have automation that we can typically be adding and making more scripts for stuff that has recently been developed. So we're still plenty busy. That's a good segue into another question I had for you, which is um, at the beginning of the sprint, while the developers are hammering out this sprint's code, how would the testers keep busy? Well, what, what are the developers working off of? Do they have specs? Do they have some sort of functional requirements? So let's assume something? best case scenario, they have a prioritized backlog with awesome user stories. They've done their sprint planning. They if you've got user awesome stories. user stories, you have enough to start writing test cases. Sure. Yeah, and you can be writing test cases. Then, depending on who's done first, I mean, if you've done your test cases before the code's written, the developer can even look at the test cases to make sure before you get it to you that it's, it's there. Cool. So in marketing, we have three developers, three big people. One is uh, writing code for web service testing, so he's holding the phone, right? Another one writing test for you on automation, he's holding as well. And then one person, it's me, who is like analyzing those tests to see if there are overlapping because you don't have to test. Sometimes run to the web service and to the UI and deciding, okay, if they're going to automate this here, this way, this way, this here, and something that we cannot automate, I will execute many. So we are all busy from the day one. And the person who is actually uh, doing automation for the web services is working with the free developer. And he starts writing tests as soon as he starts writing code and executes constantly. So it's no waste. Uh, I was kind of being devil's advocate when I asked the question because I've been through a few transitions from a waterfall model to a more agile model and one of the naive questions that management always comes up with is, well, what are the testers going to do early in the sprint if there's nothing to test? And realistically, I think everybody in this room knows that um, you can work on the test cases for a little while, but inevitably, except for the very first sprint ever, there's going to be technical debt that you know you have to repay. And it sounds like you probably brought that up. Um, you know it's there, you might as well do it. There are things that are ugly and manual that you can automate, where there's automation that's kind of old and sticky that you need to improve. Is that, is that common with everybody else as well? Do you, do you actually regularly work on technical debt, or do you set it aside 
four, you know, straight four out of six, and then you do the technical debt there that way. No, that's no. You say you're going to do the technical debt there. You say. We tried that, and that doesn't work because if you set the fund in virtual to that, or the fund will shock the guys and send that in will deliver, deliver in future. I need it, right? So what we did, we took twenty percent of our time during the iteration to the second So you have these stories that you really work with that. One point to add, you're transitioning from one call to right to our daily, by definition, development either sit around and wait for you to finish the water pool or they start without and that's something we we definitely experienced um, even though we're slow um, near the end we tend to have a regression period of around a month with the amount of mature dimensions you want and a good period when there's not many defects the development team is looking for work from then maybe not so we, we, we haven't figured out how to get around this yet but um, it normally starts with the first sprint or two with hardly any QA is kind of breaking the rule, and then the QA appears in greater numbers and captures up. So the first spin or two we're not as involved, we catch up and then we're more involved later. Um, we get that as a side effect too. Uh, I mentioned our release process. Often uh, the testers are preoccupied with getting that ready for release, and that can consume a couple of weeks. So that gives a couple of weeks for the developers to get a bit of a head start. It's often nice because, you know, I personally like having both the code and, you know, documentation at the same time when I'm looking at something. So, you know, I can work with documentation and come up with some tests, but ultimately it means I'm just going to have to go back and review and then execute those tests. So that becomes a two-step process, whereas if I've got everything right there at once, I can do it all at once. Yeah. So I don't mind that the developers get a bit ahead uh, because they never get that far ahead. Yeah. So, and then once they're caught up, it's, more, it's not as if they did it four months ago and they're like, oh yeah, let's go fix that defect in the code. It's fairly easy. That's right. Or you can do something differently. <laughs> yeah, exact so release uh, cycle where you test it, right? Uh, we forced developers to test the code. And they hate it, of course, which I understand. So what we end up doing that is, okay, guys, you hate, so you see what we're doing with it. Help us write to the automation test with that coding, right? So they, in this release, the last release, they set it up and they cover up the parts they could uh, automation. Help, you know, refactor, add new tests, all. And then the next release, because then we have this release, is going to be, uh, I mean, civilization is going to be short. That's why we know the closer testers get to developers, the less good testing. Developers are prone, I'm not saying they're not doing that, but there's definitely less incentive for the developer to be doing that unit test coverage that I expect. Yeah, so two or three things which are happening at least uh, that we are seeing. One is the test automation, definitely more and more of our customers definitely are asking for it. Part of it is obviously agile. Part of it is uh, the Today, I think automation has become somewhat more mainstream, so getting resources on automation also is becoming easier. And second thing is obviously developers and testers are working on closely. So even when we are doing testing, somebody else is doing development, we are getting part of the daily, you know, daily scrums which happen. And uh, that was not the case maybe four or five years ago. So it is becoming more mainstream. And uh, the third thing is obviously which I think uh, Good touch on that little bit is really like smoke test automation is making a big thing that because so many builds are coming that really need some strong test automation that whether this build is even worth testing further or not. So that's the clear low hanging fruit in terms of the uh, test automation. This is obviously a very well known slide. But obviously what is happening in this is, uh, so this slide I'm sure all of you have seen that sooner you find a defect, the less are the cost to fix it. But uh, there, Sherry, taking your point, what's happening is really the developers need to do a better job, whether it is unit testing or test automation or white box testing, whatever you say. I think uh, today organizations are realizing that uh, 
really testing is not the panacea. You need to write better quality code, you need to use uh, components which are properly tested, you need to do far more test automation at the developer's level. And that's where I later on we cover that how developers and tests are somewhat the roles are also blending. So developers also need to look at it from a testing perspective. So they call it test driven development, or they call it some other way, but uh, you don't have the time and luxury of doing all the testing at the end. Any questions so, or any thoughts on this one? So this is uh, another uh, thing which we already touched upon is that today in the Agile world what's happening is further complicated by that more and more teams are global as well as even when teams are not global, people are working remotely. So on one side that is a challenge but on the other side the tools like GoToMeeting or Skype and so on, those tools have made life easier because you can really collaborate in real time. Also what's happening is a lot of virtual teams are being so there might be external developers, internal developers, testers, consultants, many times with customers uh, get engaged in the process. So on some side certain tools are like this is a TFS snapshot, but many other tools today, when these tools are designed, they are designed in a way that all the, you know, the global component of how the software development and testing happens that is taken into consideration. For example, when we build team at our place, we don't really care whether that person is in Vancouver or is in India. Obviously, it is defined more by what the customer need is and which role needs to be where rather than whether we need to do the complete project here or the complete project in a remote location. Any question? Yeah, so this is uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting slide in the way that uh, what we are trying to say here is that uh, you know, in the perfect world it looks like the code will be properly object oriented, encapsulated and all the, you know, all the good books of agile and software development, all the rules have been followed. But in reality it doesn't happen. Actually what's happening is today more and more organizations are using different components. And those components are third party components, Everyone, every component has got their own issues around stability, scalability, performance, etc. So it looks like in theory that if we combine all the components and do some coding on top of it, everything will work. But in reality, it doesn't happen. And for testers, it really becomes difficult so that whether they test at the component level, whether they do the complete black box testing and how do we find that Defect and at what stage or to what extent we report. And digging deeper really becomes a problem. Earlier in the waterfall model, you will develop it in a very monolithic way. So the tester's job was that just when the complete software is developed, you test it and report the defects. Are you guys using more and more components or uh, is still uh, most of it is monolithic? Uh, I'm sorry. More and more components you are using when you are developing software, or is still all the software is developed from the scratch? Well, like third-party components, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, we have third-party components. And does that make testing more challenging, or? I wouldn't necessarily say that it's more challenging because we just make sure that we all consistently use the same compilatory. So if something is going to be used, it's like it's all uniformly across the whole platforms. Um, that's not to say that we don't encounter bugs with it at some time. Um, some of our work on plugins, for example, as we try to do more and more things with plugins, sometimes we push the eyes on what it's originally intended to do. Um, it can slow things down if it's a problem that needs to be corrected by the third party as opposed to in house. Um, you know, that might actually force us to look for an alternative sometimes. But, I don't see it as more of a challenge. And do testers go to the component level or generally they will do only the black box of testing? No, the testers would report the problem and as the developer investigates the solution, we would discover where the problem lies and that might add an additional layer of complexity on how it's going to be solved. But 
it's not something that uh, we encounter much. We, we don't we don't find the need to be too leading edge with our technology. So we can choose conservatively. So these things that you know, it's pretty mainstream. Because uh, some of our clients, uh, you know, when we test, I think another problem comes with all the cloud and all the third party APIs. So when we're integrating more and more, and then if somebody else changes their part of the world, everything else. Yeah, we're adjusting other people that way. And we're developing APIs. Yeah. So. I think SaaS poses particularly interesting challenges uh, as well because the the SLA that you might have with a particular SaaS vendor kind of will say, yeah, you're at the mercy of us for every API change you make, and you just have to be really reactive if you're consuming that, that API. Yes, other part is, which is obviously this is the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which is basically the entropy, but the disorder will either remain constant or increase in a closed uh, system. And what happens is, uh, well, most of the time, software keeps on changing. Well, the software, the modified software, will enhance the change request, and many other issues come up. So obviously, this is the uh, if one window is broken, the other windows will automatically break and we won't even know. So again, for testers, it, become, it becomes a tricky issue that at what stage one is, how do you find that one window is broken and what is its uh, effect on other parts of the software. And uh, the key issue here, again, what's happening is in the agile world, it makes things more complex because uh, but things are moving so fast, and also in the lean world, we are trying to reduce all the wastage. So, again, a lot of solution really comes back to how you smartly do the automation. So, some of these early warnings you can find and try to fix. Any examples of uh, this? Uh, anybody would like to share where? You came across a particular problem because the code was modified or enhanced and it broke everything else. Yes, <laughs> but this we have found uh, no, really no, a key issue, particularly when we when customer outsourcing was many times it becomes very unpredictable because you say, okay, this problem will be fixed or this part is broken, but then it's just a symptom rather than the real story then. Find one window after another which is broken. The other thing is, I think, uh, so on one side, as an industry, we are quite proud that developers and testers are creative, but also there is a human component to it. So we have our own uh, way of doing things, we use creativity, we many times have conflict in priorities, we have. So we feel that developers will write a perfect code. But as you were saying that ideally developers should do the unit testing and all those things, but really that doesn't happen. Plus also, now with so much being available through Google, etc., developers also many times take a shortcut or they say let's play with a new tool, etc. And if the information is really not shared, tester on the other side will not even know what, what went wrong, what are the new things which, uh, which a developer has uh, used. And uh, the other side of that is, which comes back to the requirements part, the users are human. So there is a predictable behavior which you can write a test case for and you can test. But there are many usability components which uh, really are difficult to predict and also obviously even difficult to automate. So we say in Agile really we need to move faster, but some of the user behavior issues they are difficult to figure out. And uh, this part I covered a little bit, but really today for solving a problem, there are multiple solutions, whether it is for developers or testers. And so if you have a good script for creativity, it is difficult, it's easy to predict. But if developers and testers are using your, their own uh, 
ways of doing things, many times it really becomes difficult. So part of it you can solve through communication and sitting next to each other and wiki and all that, but that's really the nature of the problem. Any questions or thoughts on this? So that's an interesting question. So what's your tester? Hmm. I see one of my colleagues here, let me ask her. Oh, I, I didn't realize Maggie would be here. So Maggie, what's a tester? <laughs> What is your expectation from a tester if you ask a developer? Maybe. Yeah. Me? Yeah, okay, yeah, what do you answer? What, what's, uh, what do you think is a tester? Uh, it's kind of like a, a customer simulator, if you will. Someone who <laughs> <laughs> stand in the customer's shoes and uh, <coughs> tell you maybe either what the customer would not, or rather than a customer which might withdraw their business, actually communicate with you and you get a chance to fix your problem before someone even more important sees it. And what's a developer? This man has two different sites. So half is developer, half is tester. So what do you think is a developer? Maybe you can answer that question. A developer? A uh, developer is a person who takes a requirement that the customer has asked for as um, part of your product and implements that requirement in a functional way. Both developer and tester is a role, really. Any person, no matter what their title is, can do or be either one of those things at any moment, depending on what it is they're doing. Obviously, as a developer in a small company, a lot of the time you have to do some testing too. So in those moments, I'm a tester. I'm going to be the, you know, the placeholder or whatever for the customer who sees what it would be like from the customer's point of view to actually use this. Uh, so, no, so that's a good point actually. That's exactly what we are trying to reach here is that really today the rules, a developer many a times uh, might be playing the role of tester. And actually, even the other way around, that's why this session on testers, that even for testers it will be important to play sometimes the role of developer. Even in our organization today, we are hiring testers. Most of them have a development background. Because otherwise, it's really becoming difficult for a tester to test. Because testing also is moving away from traditional black box testing and more and more towards front end of the development side. So, plus also what's happening in the lead model is that a lot of the time the requirements and those detailed analysis, etc., is not happening in far more execution is happening. So if testers are used to the traditional black box, they are finding it really difficult. So this man is all grey or... Yeah. So what is a lean tester? Any? You know my four points? <laughs> no, just uh, whatever your your perception of a lead tester is okay. Let's not worry about what's the right definition. So he reduces waste. Sorry? A tester that helps reduce waste, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if lead, so. Or is it what's an agile tester? Okay, okay that's right. Yeah. Somebody who's very involved that has value. Involved. I mean, I 
suppose just you could be involved in reviewing the requirements documents while the code is being written, even in the waterfall setting. But that would that that approach would have more agility to it than to just go through everything. So it is it's just about being able to get involved and start correcting things sooner. Getting back to that other graph about the cost of the effect. Yeah, so our definition of lean tester really is, as you actually said, uh, which we sure you were quite right, is that in the lean uh, software dev process, uh, who can uh, reduce the wastage to the, who can, uh, who can maximize the reduction of, who can have the least wastage. And uh, really the, the so when, for example, if we interview for a tester who has to work in a lean environment, we really look for a person. One is uh, you know, who can understand uh, really from a software developer's perspective how these requirements are and where the developers can be you know, going wrong so that they can establish a good empathy with the developer because they need to work very closely with the developer. They should also understand the code to some extent. Without uh, doing the code, it's difficult to have a meaningful discussion with the developer, they should also rely on less documentation, but they should have good understanding of the context because documentation is reducing. And these are some of the ways we see that uh, whether the tester would be effective in a lean environment or not. So, but the good thing is uh, that the testing as a business is growing. So this goes back to our original title that really whether testers will go out of business, our view is that testing as a business is growing. Even today in the Bangor market, you see that the tremendous opportunity for good quality testers. Part of the reason is because I think there's more and more automation happening. People are getting more used to technology, whether it's new devices, new applications, embedded systems, and obviously software as a service, etc., which are coming. So overall, also, you are seeing the bigger testing community, bigger blocks, a lot of things which are happening on the testing side. And, uh, and I think, uh, so if, and we'll cover it in the future slides, is uh, if we have the right skills, the testing market is definitely growing. In fact, testers are becoming more important because software is being launched more often. And this is uh, the way the roles are. What we are seeing is that uh, the skills for testers, they are moving from right quadrants to the left quadrants. So earlier there used to be manual testing, there were two very well defined quadrants. One was a manual tester who would do all the exploratory and usability testing, etc. And then there were people who were using tools like HPQT or Microsoft Test Manager, etc. or say Google Trender for performance testing or Selenium for test automation, etc. But now the expectation from testers are they are moving more and more towards white box testing on one side and they should also be able to understand the code so that all the unit testing and component testing, etc. Even if they don't do it, developer is doing it, they should be able to look at it and come up with some really relevant feedback. Do you guys uh, see that happening in your industry or this is a... Uh, <coughs> still have the mix. So when I test it, still have Yeah. Yeah, there are certain things which uh, also even if one is automation is expensive. Second thing is there are still certain tests like certain UI components etc. You do need uh, manual testing. But uh, we are definitely seeing a trend towards where yeah, more and more white box testing definitely is happening. For example, going back to the example of unit testing, earlier I think people did not care that much about unit testing. But now more and more clients also they say there is certain unit test coverage which they are looking for. But otherwise, uh, really it becomes difficult in a two weeks uh, delivery cycle to do everything through black box testing. So this is one of our last two or three slides. So what we 
our suggestion in this would be really what's happening is that today if you are a traditional tester, it makes tremendous sense to really invest in the education part and most of those things are really around uh, one is cloud is playing a big role. So there are two or three things is happening in cloud. One is there are a lot of cloud based testing solutions which have emerged, whether it's for performance testing tools like Swesta, etc., whether it is the complete testing infrastructure you can today create on cloud plus whatever software you have, you have to integrate with various third party cloud services. So, in fact, today, Jason, as you were mentioning, the morning was that today a very clear expectation from a tester is that you should be able to set up a testing infrastructure on Amazon and get going. In previous days, a tester would expect that they will get a test environment and they will do the black box testing. Those days are somewhat gone. Same thing is around mobility. Again, uh, there are a lot of third party mobile testing solutions like device anywhere or perfecto etc. And again the expectation from testers is they should be able to set it up and get going. Also what is happening is that the testers are becoming integrated part of the team. So soft skills are becoming more and more important. Earlier testers job was to really find the defects and say, Mr. Developer, you have not done these 20 things right. So it was somewhat you versus me type of approach, but now testers and developers are becoming part of one single team. Any other skills which uh, you feel is important for tester in the new world? Yeah, sure, go ahead. A lot of the times the requirements are different from day to day. So if there ever was a requirements document, if you were lucky enough to get one in the first place, chances are between the conversations that have happened from the time it was written to the time that you're involved, it's changed. So you're going to have to go all over again and find the, the trail of conversations that have happened. Because you may say, oh, there's a defect. It doesn't match the requirement. But oh, well, we had a conversation yesterday where we decided that wasn't right. So we changed the requirement, but didn't update the document or whatever. So I think that that's probably a pretty and common issue. Yep. Yeah, so really, yeah, the documentation is far less than now, absolutely. Yeah, so the last slide is, our view is that uh, we really feel for the testing community, that's why we have this business, uh, which we run, there are exciting times ahead for testing community. In fact, more and more we see it as an opportunity because uh, with so many things happening, uh, whether it is on the cloud side, mobility side, integration, APIs, etc., that uh, testing is becoming complex and really the intellectual power there would help. Also, rightly or wrongly, the world has moved to lean agile. Whether it is fair, it's difficult to say, but more and more organizations believe that that's the right thing to do. I, I personally feel it's not a fair, it's a good way to do, but uh, at least as of today, that is that most of the organizations are looking for lean or agile of doing things. The, again, the new trends like cloud, mobility, global teams, continuous integration, etc. That is again a reality and testers need to be pretty much up to the speed on that. Also, the fourth point which is really important is that we are seeing testers and developers, the roles are really blending. So many a times developer would be playing role of tester and even other way around which never used to happen, but today the expectation is that tester should be able to see the code and look at what is going wrong. So our view is issue is not whether testers would be out of business, the issue is that testers can they reinvent and learn some of these new skills to make themselves uh, relevant in this uh, World of Agile and Lean. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question then. Yeah. Uh, when I used to work in a water quality environment, I obviously had a, an allocated amount of time where I could write test cases. And at the end of the period when it was my time to test, I could run through those test cases and, and see where things are at. And I'm finding in an agile environment um, and being the only tester really within our company. I don't have a lot of time or any time in some cases to write test cases. 
And so a lot of the testing that I do is just basically the user stories that are logged in our tracking system or the bugs that are logged in our tracking system, I'm testing those. And if, I, if I'm lucky and if I have a little bit of time at the end, I can kind of do some smoke testing. So I'm just trying to get a feel from other people as to are test cases still necessary, and if so, how do you how do you handle them in the agile environment? So I can I can give you some of the examples the way we do it many times when we have this type of issue. One is many customers today are happy with the idea of not doing user cases as well as test cases. So really, user stories are like test cases. So you may do it other way around where you say that when a person is writing a user story, they should write it like a test case. So if you tell like a typical test driven development type of thing, that may be one way of uh, one way of doing it. The other way is obviously it's a question of how much time and effort you put in testing. I mean you can do user stories as well as test cases as well as automation obviously that helps. But today typically in an agile with the user stories and test cases it's quite a quite a bit of overhead in many organizations today. A lot of a lot of companies don't ask what is the test case telling me that the automation doesn't. If you ask that question, the answer you might get is not very much. If you have good automation that's you know kind of in any kind of scripting language that also allows comments. Maybe that's not. And you have the benefit of it being able to execute itself, whereas you, you, you need a human to go through the, the test case things. See, the issue is whatever process you follow, if you can keep it simple, but just follow the same process. The problem in this model comes is tomorrow when that person leaves the organization, the next person comes, is that all process really hurts at that point in time. So as long as you can document this process as simple as it is that when the next person comes, if they can follow the same, that really gives a continuity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, beyond the obvious of you know, testing finds bugs, how do you see uh, the relationship of testing and quality? I mean, how does your tester go on to in, in reinvent themselves, if you like, to improve the code quality of a developer? Just beyond the, the obvious finding bugs. That's a great question. What I've seen a lot of is um, evangelism. The, the tester will be the quality champion. They'll be in charge of running behind the developer's desk and smacking them all on the head and saying, hang on a second, did you follow the coding standards? Did you, you know, when you were designing this thing and you picked a linked list, did you consider using a hash table instead, stuff like that? So you're, but in order to do that, your tester is actually looking very closely at the code. Is that the norm? What we're seeing from our perspective is there's greater emphasis on white box testing. There's more demand for a tester who could also do development, and and it gives them more to do at every stage in the software development lifecycle. They can participate in architecture discussions. They can participate in design discussions. Maybe there are even somebody who has a good eye and they can interact with UX people. See, what we also do is, uh, so we like uh, putting everything on dashboards. So we don't need to write, John did this thing wrong, but we say this thing was done wrong. And most of the time, John knows that this was his code which already did poorly. Also, what we do is, uh, so that is what we display really on dashboard. But what we also do is that there are certain benchmarks like unit test coverage. Whatever code goes out from our factory should be 70-75% unit test coverage should be there. And then when the reviews are happening, so basically audits happen on a random sampling basis, but when the reviews are happening, some of those things do come out. But I think, uh, as Jason rightly said, evangelism helps. So if as an organization you know that no, people should write good quality code and it should be well commented, it should be unit test coverage should be there over a period of time, Things, uh, things improve, and uh, but yes, it's like building a quality culture. It's not easy. I've, I've been confused about uh, the, the relationship between quality and testing for years. Ever since I came across my first QA department that did only did testing, um, and you know, it seems to me that 
you know, the two things are very closely related, but they're not the same. That, that's why uh, testers, it's part of the, the quality assurance, right? It's not the, the, the whole thing, because no, I prefer to call not the tester, the QA analyst, because this is a more that what we're doing, not just mechanically executing our test cases. We're involved in the process of... So expanding uh, yeah. the role. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I think that's Make sure great. the processes are in place and you, you're involved in the design of that. This is the, the key, key thing. I've always thought about QA and testing as two completely different things. Uh, it, it, it annoys me and my company every time everyone calls testing QA or the QA guy. And, and I think, well, testing is testing and QA is QA. Quality assurance is something that is done from the very beginning conception, quality in design, quality in development, and quality in testing, quality in deployment. QA is something that goes from end to end. QA is not testing. Testing is testing. So, yeah, I think we are out of time. And you have 30 seconds and you have two more points. So, so, he suggested the right thing. He said, no, just ask the, all the participants to do the voting that who gets these two. Who should get these? You guys nominated the two people, yeah? Oh, yeah. oh okay. Congratulations, <laughs> yeah. Can I nominate that gentleman over there? Second year. <laughs> Great, yeah. Well, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, yeah.